Hello, welcome to 1.2 Types of Business Entities. Public Sector, Surplus, BBC, NASA, Private Sector, Profit, Netflix, Liability, Legal Identity, Incorporation, Transparency, Corpus, Soul Traders, Partnerships, Sleeping Partners, Companies, BOD, CEO, AGM, EGM, IPO, Privately Held Companies, Publicly Held Companies, Fun Fact, China, Lego, $85, Social Enterprises, Cooperatives, NGOs, Swift, AO3 Evaluation, Geek Teachers, Arena and Masha. If you know all of these things, then you can skip this video class. If you don't, then subscribe, like, leave a comment with any questions you have, and watch the rest of the video. Enjoy! So in this class there are three parts – private and public sector, companies, sole traders and partnerships, and social enterprises. And even though I broke down this class into three parts, there are four assessment objectives. The first part of this class is private and public sector, and the objective here is distinguish between private and public sector, which is AO2. Just a reminder that if your teacher does not know what AO2 or AO3 or 1 or 4 is, then you'd better make sure he or she does. As you can see from the title of this class, we're going to talk about sectors. We already talked about sectors in 1.1, some of you who watched the previous video might ask, but those were different sectors. Sectors that we were talking about before were primary sector, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. These are sectors of industry. These four sectors are about what businesses in an economy do, about the nature of their activity. Today we're talking about uh, sectors of ownership. Public sectors, briefly, belong to the government. All companies in the country that belong, that are funded by or run by the government. All the businesses that belong to individuals or group or individuals are private sector. Okay? So you can divide economy into four sectors based on the nature of their activity, or you can divide all businesses in the country into two sectors, private or public, depending on who owns them sectors of industry versus sectors of ownership. So if some of you think that there are six sectors in an economy, then you are wrong. There are four plus two sectors, because these sectors refer to different things. Uh, for example, if we talk about Coca-Cola, it's producing drinks, so it's in the secondary sector. At the same time, it is a privately owned company, it is in the private sector. So it's in two sectors at the same time, in the secondary sector of uh, industry and in the private sector of ownership. I hope that's clear. Now, once we know the difference between sectors of ownership and sectors of industry, we are ready to talk about them in more detail. Public sector. Public sectors are created by governments to provide public services and protection to citizens. Examples of activities they can do is transportation, infrastructure, in some countries it's education or, or healthcare. Some students think that public sector businesses provide uh, their services or products for free. They don't cost anything because they're owned by the government. This is not the case. For example, in many countries, postal service is nationalized. This is a public sector uh, business. But when you go to the post office, you still buy a stamp and you have to pay for it. So in this way, some public sector uh, businesses, they make money, actually, all right? But it's not a privately held owned company. Uh, so all the profits that are made are not distributed between owners, because there is no owner as such. They belong to everyone, they belong to the country. That is why we do not call it profit. We call the positive difference between revenue and cost surplus. So when we say surplus, we imply public sector organizations. The main benefit of public sector is that it's socially oriented. It's funded by tax revenue, it cares about people, the entire essence of public sector organizations is, or at least should be, caring about citizens. However, the drawback of public sector organizations is that they're not as efficient as public sector. Very often they are monopolists, and even if they are not, they do not really have to compete with other businesses as much as private sector organizations, because they are supported by tax. They are not that motivated, they don't have to survive, they don't have to innovate. So that is why the services that they provide in some countries are not very 
good, not very efficient, not very nice, but at the same time, public sector organizations are socially oriented. Some examples of public sector organizations could be BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, USPS, United States Postal Service, NHS, National Health Service, again in the UK, and NASA. You all know what that is, I'm not gonna explain. The next item on our list is private sector. Private sector organizations are quite the opposite of public sector. They earn profits in order to compensate to their owners. In this case, we do call it profits. So for public sector organizations, we say surplus. For private sector organizations, we say profit. Even though from mathematical perspective, it's exactly the same thing. It's the positive difference between revenues and costs. Private sector organizations are owned by individuals or groups of individuals. Their pros and cons are exactly the opposite of public sector organizations. It's the same thing, but in reverse. Many private sector organizations are not as socially oriented as public sector organizations. They mainly care about money, about making profits in order to compensate for their investment. But on the other hand, the goods and services that they provide are really good because they have to compete. If what they provide is not good enough and people don't buy it, then it means that private sector organization might simply go bankrupt. They have to innovate, they have to be creative, and they have to uh, satisfy needs and wants of people in such a way that they remain profitable. So we have private sector that is really efficient, doesn't really care about people much, and we have public sector that cares about people a lot, but is not always very efficient. Some examples of private sector organizations could be Coca-Cola, Burger King, Netflix, Apple, Google, or any other uh, company that you might probably know. You might also be interested in how large public sector is in different countries. So here are some examples. Cuba is number one country on the list. The public sector in this country is 77%. It means that 77% of all people in Cuba work for the government. In the United States, it's only 13.3%. One of the lowest public sectors in the world is in Japan, only 7.7%. Don't forget to check the text version of this class. I have a lot of useful links there and all the illustrations and everything. Some people prefer reading, some people prefer watching, some people prefer listening. I'm trying to give you information in any kind you want, but check out my website. The second part of this class is called Companies, Sole Traders and Partnerships. And the objective here is evaluate the main features of the following types of organizations, sole traders, partnerships, privately held companies, publicly held companies, AO3. AO3 means evaluation, so that's what we're gonna start with. First of all, we're gonna learn to evaluate. We will come up with certain criteria or key terms that we will use for evaluation. So here we go. So the first term here is liability. You're just a liability, CJ! Liability means the extent to which you risk losing your personal possessions in case of the business failure. It can be limited or unlimited. Unlimited liability means that you're personally responsible for all the losses that a business might have. I'm going to give you a very pessimistic example. Let's say you are a sole trader and sole traders have unlimited liability and uh, it means that you personally are responsible for all the debts and all the losses that your business has because there's no difference between you and your business. It's essentially the same thing. So you take a loan uh, in a bank, you're a business development loan, and you buy a truck to deliver your pizza that you make at home. And then unfortunately your business doesn't go well economy is going to hell, uh, things don't work out well, and you cannot pay back this loan, okay? So you shut down your business, but the bank might come to your house and take your personal belongings if you are not able to pay back this loan, because you have unlimited liability. You're personally 100% responsible with your personal assets for all the debts and losses. Once again, this is a very pessimistic example, and in most cases, the loans that unlimited liability businesses have are pretty small, and most sole traders do not end up losing their personal possessions, 
but however, this example is perfect to illustrate what unlimited liability is. Limited liability means that your responsibility for business is limited, is constrained with your initial investment. For example, if tomorrow you decide to buy shares of, let's say, Amazon, and the day after tomorrow Amazon goes bankrupt, it doesn't mean that someone will come to your house to take your personal belongings because Amazon went bankrupt and it owes money to the bank. It means that your biggest risk is losing your initial investment. So if tomorrow you buy shares for $100, this is your highest risk. Your liability for the business is limited with your initial investment, which is $100 in this case. All right, so we have liability, which can be limited when you ri only risk losing your initial investment and unlimited when you risk losing everything you own. Liability is also related to legal identity. Legal identity is whether you exist or not from the law perspective, all right? So I'm quite sure that you have a passport or another form of ID. If you do not have any, it means that you do not in fact exist for the government, for job applications. Even though you are a real human being without a document, you don't exist from law perspective. So some businesses, they do not have legal identity such as sole traders. For example, if I run a business and I am a sole trader, I, my business does not have its own legal identity. My business and myself are the same thing. So my personal legal identity of Mr. Ilya is the same as the identity of my business. We are the same. There's no distinction between me and my business. Okay, it's the same entity. However, for companies, they have their own separate legal identity, all right? For example, if you buy lemonade from a sole trader and you get a food poisoning, then you will probably sue the sole trader. But if you buy an iPhone and it doesn't work well and you refuse the refund, then you're not likely to sue Tim Cook or Steve Jobs personally, even though they are related to the company. You will sue Apple because Apple has its own legal identity. So now you know what legal identity is, now it's time to talk about corpus. <laughs> corpus is a Latin word which means body. Probably you know what corpse is, this word also comes from corpus. This Latin word also helped to make two English words, incorporated, which means there is a body, and unincorporated, which means there is no body created. Let me explain what it means. Sounds really weird. Some businesses do not have an extra body. For example, if I start run a business as a sole trader, that we'll talk about in a moment, another legal identity is not created. My body and my business body is the same body. This one. So this business would be unincorporated because there is no another body, another legal identity created. However, Apple is not the same as Steve Jobs. It's not the same as Tim Cook or board of directors. Apple has its own legal identity. So Apple is incorporated. Apple INC. Now you know what INC means. You're welcome. The next word on the list is transparency. Transparency usually refers to physical objects. The extent to which you can see through, it also applies to businesses. Some businesses are quite private. They do not have to make most of their financial information uh, public. However, some businesses, especially publicly held companies, such as Apple, Amazon, Google, and etc., they do have to make their accounts public. You want to know how much money Apple made last year? Just go onto their website and look it up. So some businesses are really transparent, whereas some are not. Why is that so? You have to continue watching to find out. The next item on the list is accountability. Accountability means being answerable to someone. Some businesses, again, such as sole trader, have really low accountability because this is one person. You are accountable, you are answerable to yourself. But the more people are involved in an organization, the more accountability there is within this organization. That's pretty simple. And the last term is setup cost. It's simply the amount of money needed to start up a business in this or that form of business entity. Spoiler alert, uh, sole traders are the ones that are the cheapest to start, usually in most countries, 
and public limited companies are the most expensive to set up. Their setup costs are the highest. Now you know all the important terms for evaluation. Now you know how to evaluate. Now you can use these words as criteria to make judgments between the four types of entities that we're going to talk about. Sole traders, partnerships, privately held and publicly held companies. Now what I ask my students to do in the class is to fill in the worksheet that you see on your screen right now. We have four different types of business entities here and we have a bunch of factors to compare them. Some of them are self-explanatory, number of owners, reason to choose, how easy to set up, etc. Some of them are more difficult, but I have just told you what they mean. For example, liability and transparency. Actually, based on what I shared with you so far, you can already fill in some gaps in this worksheet. Now you'll know more, so continue making notes in a systematic manner using my worksheet. Sole traders. Ta-da! Sole traders are people who run businesses alone. Uh, there is no extra legal identity, no extra body created. So these businesses are unincorporated. Owner equals business. Equal business equals owner. This type of business entity has unlimited liability, which means, as I mentioned earlier, that you are personally responsible for all the debts and losses that a business might have. The risks of failure for sole traders are pretty high because most sole traders are inexperienced entrepreneurs and the chances that they will succeed are pretty low, at least in the first try they might not succeed. That is why banks and uh, investors are reluctant to provide loans and funding to sole traders. The good stuff about sole traders is that they have no one to share their profits with because it's just one person, so whatever you own is yours. Just pay tax. So as I mentioned earlier, finance is pretty limited to sole traders because no one is willing to invest into them much compared to companies that we'll talk about later. Usually sole traders focus on day-to-day -day expenditure. These are just people who retired or who want to leave to maintain their own life-work balance. They are not strategically oriented. They have quite short-term orientation. This business has no continuity. So if an owner passes away or something else happens to the owner, then business is done. If you want to have some continuity, then you need to register your business in a different form of entity. Sole traders, however, feel closer to customer. For example, think about your uh, corner store in your neighborhood where you buy some snacks and water. Probably owner is working there on his own or her own and you know them personally and uh, it just feels nice compared to big corporations that have no soul and don't care about anything except for money. <laughs> Sole traders cannot compete with corporations. So if you run a small furniture store and IKEA opens next door, then you need to make sure your unique selling point is something that distinguishes you greatly from IKEA. Otherwise, you cannot stand this competition with a huge multinational company. The IB uses British terminology for business. So sole trader is what they say in the UK. In the US, it's called sole proprietor, which is essentially the same thing partnerships so partnership is two or more people usually between 2 to 20 who run a business together basically it's like a group of sole traders that run the same business that share the risks but at the same time share profits however not all partners in a partnership have to run the business some people just prefer to give some money not run the business at all and just have their portion of profits for that these types of partners are called sleeping partners or silent partners. But there are different kinds of partnerships, but the traditional partnership has unlimited liability, just like sole traders, which means that partners are personally liable, personally responsible for all the debts and losses that a business might have. As I've mentioned that many times before, hopefully now you totally get it. In partnerships, decision-making is a little bit long because there is higher degree of accountability. Now you can no longer make all the decisions on your own. You have partners that you need to agree with before decisions are made. So decision-making takes longer, but at the same time, the risks are lower because there are simply more people. Finance is more available to partnerships compared to sole traders, but that's just because there are more people involved in the business. Banks and investors are still reluctant 
to provide funds to partnerships. In terms of continuity, partnerships are better than sole traders. Partners can come and go, the business can still run longer, whereas in the sole trader, no owner, no business. The most important document for partnerships is called deed of partnership or partnership agreement. It's like a constitution. It says all the rules, how to enter a partnership, how to exit a partnership, what you can do, what you cannot do, how profits are distributed, how workload is distributed, etc, etc. Companies. So there are two types of companies, privately held and publicly held, but both types have the same features. So now we're talking about all companies. We're not distinguishing them into private and public yet. So companies can have unlimited number of shareholders or owners. Owners is what we say for sole traders and partnerships. Owners of companies are called shareholders. So whenever I talk about company, I'm going to say shareholder from now on. Companies have limited liability, which means that your biggest risk is losing your initial investment. And companies are incorporated, which means that a business has its own legal identity. If you don't understand what it is, scroll back a little bit. So if you buy shares of Apple or Amazon, it doesn't mean that you have to go to work tomorrow 8 a.m. to this company, right? You own the company, but you do not have to work for it. So who works for the company then? Who decides what's going to happen on a strategic level? the long term. BOD or board of directors is elected for it plus CEO is appointed for day-to-day -day running of the business. Board of directors usually includes majority shareholders. Majority shareholders are those shareholders who have more shares than others. By the way, very often people think that majority stake is 51%, which is actually true, but this is the ultimate majority stake. Uh, very often it doesn't have to be 51%. As long as it's higher than other shareholders stake, then you have the final say. It does not have to be 51%. Because of unlimited liability, in case of bankruptcy, companies' assets are seized, not personal assets of their owners. Since the highest risk is losing only the initial investment, companies have greater access to capital because people are more likely to invest into it. They know that the biggest risk is just initial investment, so please take my money. The degree of continuity is pretty high in companies, the highest among all, because even after the founders of the company pass, companies still exist. The three most important documents in a company are memorandum of association, articles of association, and certificate of incorporation. Memorandum includes all the conditions that are necessary for stars in a company. Articles refers to the basic rules of the company. It's like a constitution, but for a company. Certificate of incorporation is a document that the government provides to companies that allows these companies to start commercial activities, start trading. So the date of on certificate of incorporation would be the birthday, the formal birthday of the company. The last thing to say about companies is that there are two types that we're going to learn, privately held companies and publicly held companies. So the next point is privately held companies. Private companies have relatively small number of shareholders. That is because their shares are not that easy to buy. If you want to buy shares of Apple or Amazon, you can just do it online in an app or contact your broker and do that. But with private limited companies, it's always a private deal. You need to contact the current shareholders and ask them to sell you some shares. So the way it works, it's just up to the company itself. At the same time, it's more difficult to cash out from privately held companies. Again, you cannot sell your shares on stock exchange whenever you want. You need to make a private deal again if you want to leave the company and sell your stake. Very often privately held companies are owned by families. So you might think like, okay, it's difficult to cash out, it's difficult to buy shares if I'm an outsider to the company. Why would I actually have a private limited company? Well, in addition to limited liability and higher chances of continuity, you are also not likely to lose control to outsiders. So with public limited companies, if you're super rich, technically you can buy most shares on the company, come to that company and tell CEO to do whatever you want. This is what happened to Steve Jobs. Even though he started Apple, he was kicked out from his own company because shareholders did not like his leadership style or whatever. Mark Zuckerberg, however, avoided that problem and he retained majority stake. 
so that won't happen to him. Very smart. But with private limited companies, your shares are not traded publicly. They are not traded on stock exchange. So there is zero chance that someone will come to your company and tell you what to do. This is the main benefit of privately held companies. In addition to that, they are called private for a reason. You do not have to publish that much financial information to the public because it's none of their business. Tax authorities, government, yes, but the public, not so much. So if you want to know how much Apple, Amazon or Google made, you can just find it on their website. But if you are trying to find how much money Muji or Chanel or Lego made, that might be a bit more difficult. Some examples of privately held companies are Lego, Ikea, Chanel, Marks, Rolex and Virgin Group. Publicly held companies. You cannot just start publicly held company out of the blue. It needs to be a privately held company that goes public. Going public means making your shares available to the public, issuing your shares on the stock exchange so that everyone who wants can buy them at any time. The process of selling your shares on the stock exchange to everyone for the first time is called initial public offering or IPO. And after IPO, you have no direct control over share price. I'm saying you cannot directly control the share price because you can still control it indirectly. For example, when CEO or company says or does something, it can impact the share price, it can fluctuate. Since everyone can buy shares of public limited companies and the main risk is just losing investment, public limited companies have the greatest access to capital. Once this is a well-known company, many people would be willing to buy some shares thus increasing the market capitalization of the company. So as a response to that, the government control is really scrutinized when it comes to publicly held companies. They have to make their accounts available to everyone so that everyone can see how much money is made, so that everyone can decide whether you want to retain shares or sell them and etc. As I mentioned earlier, one of the drawbacks of public limited companies is that control can be lost to outsiders. So even though Steve Jobs started Apple, the main owners of that company were other shareholders. So at some point he lost control over his own company. Most companies that you know are public limited companies. For example, Coca-Cola, China Mobile, Microsoft, HSBC, Nike, Apple, etc. Just look at these people who are saying, shut up and take my money, give me your shares. Fun facts. I know that when a teacher says fun facts, it automatically make these facts not fun <laughs> but still i hope you learn something useful from these facts so china has the three largest ipos of all times alibaba agricultural bank of china and international commercial bank of china are the three largest ipos write a comment and correct me if i'm wrong 578 this is when the oldest company in the world was established this is japanese congo gumi Fun fact about Virgin Group, it's owned by Richard Branson, the UK billionaire, a really bizarre guy. Read his book, it's really interesting and inspiring. So his company went public and then he did not like that he started to lose control and shareholders started telling him what to do. So his company went private. He bought all the shares back and changed the legal form of uh, his business from publicly held company back to privately held company. Lego has been family owned since 1932. Even though this company had plenty of chances to go public, they do not want to do that because they want to retain control. In 1997, Microsoft spent 150 million US dollars on Apple shares. So it's not just general public who can become a shareholder. Companies who have their own legal identity can also buy shares in different companies. I also remember that there's a pretty complicated ownership scheme over Volkswagen. Porsche is the majority shareholder of Volkswagen and Volkswagen owns more than 10 car brands. In 2004, when Google went public, one share was worth 85 US dollars. You can check how much it is now, but don't bite your nails too much, okay? If you know anything else that is fun and interesting to learn, please share in the comments. Thank you.
last part of this class is social enterprises. And we have two objectives here. Evaluate the main features of the following types of for-profit social enterprises, private sector companies, public sector companies, cooperatives, A03. Evaluate the main features of the following type of non-profit social enterprise, non-governmental organization, NGOs, a03. This sounds really complicated, so let me break it down for you. The IB wants us to learn about social enterprises. It divides them into two main types for profit social enterprises and non profit social enterprises. In for profit category, we have three types of social enterprises private sector companies, public sector companies, and cooperatives. In non profit category, we only have one type. NGOs, non-government organizations. I hope now it's clearer and keep in mind that what we're learning to do with all these social enterprises is to evaluate them. We're learning to be able to make some judgments about these social enterprises, whether they're good, bad and why. So the first type of social enterprises is private sector companies. Guys, we're not talking about private sector companies now. We've already talked about them. Now we only talk about those private sector companies that are social enterprises. What is a social enterprise? As you can see on the best website about IB business management, social enterprise is an organization that has social well-being as its main goals instead of making profits. It does not mean that social enterprises do not make profits. Again, there are two categories. Some of them are for-profit, some of them non-profit. In either category, they use profit as a tool to achieve social aims. So private sector companies make profits, but it is not their prior objective. Profits are a tool to achieve socially important aims, and they have exactly the same features as private sector companies that we talked about earlier, privately held companies and publicly held companies. As an example of for-profit social enterprise and the private sector company, I'm going to talk about Arena and Masha, who run two projects. One is Geek Teachers, where they arrange events for teachers to inspire for positive change. And the second one is Smenka Show, where they raise money to renovate classrooms. Here you can see what a great job they did. This is before and this is after. Looks wonderful. If you want to know more, please follow this link and donate to Smenka. I also asked Masha and Arena to tell me what are the pros and cons of running a social enterprise from their perspective. Because what's in the textbook can be quite different for some entrepreneurs. So we'll compare those when we learn to evaluate social enterprise in a couple of minutes. But for now, public sector companies. Once again, we're not talking about public sector companies in general, we're only talking about those that are social enterprises. They are the same as private sector companies, but they operate in a public sector, which means that they provide public services and they are run and funded by the government. For example, recycling, medicine, education, transportation, and etc. It was pretty hard to find examples, but then I remembered Sweden. In Sweden, or in Scandinavia in general, Sweden, Norway and Denmark, they are trying to reach 0% waste. They are trying to recycle everything and they are doing a great job. So if I'm not wrong, there are quite a lot of companies, public sector companies, that are providing recycling services, that have recycling plants and other facilities to achieve this 0% waste goal. So these companies are run and funded by the government, they have a social aim, and they provide a public service, which means that they have all the features of public sector for-profit social enterprise. If you want to know more about this example, please follow the link, it's available in English. The last type of for-profit social enterprise is cooperative. This is something new, something we haven't talked about before. One of the definitions of cooperatives is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. So if I break it down for you, basically a group of people get together and they want to create an organization that works for their own benefit. They work in this organization, they own this organization, and its main goal is to bring benefits to its members. 
and owners, which is the same thing in case of cooperatives. There are many types of cooperatives, for example, agricultural, housing or residential, financial or consumer. Currently I'm working in China, so an example of a hypothetical uh, cooperative that I give to my students is a remote Chinese village. Let's say it's really far, it's high up in the mountains, and none of the supermarkets actually want to open a branch there because it's too expensive and there are only 100 people in that village, so there is no supermarket. What these 100 people want to do is build their own supermarket that they will own, that they will work in, and they will also be customers of that supermarket. So they build a supermarket, they go every once in a while to the big city to get supplies for the supermarket, and they always have food there. So this supermarket is created not to make profits, it's created to benefit its owners or members. Another example of a cooperative would be SWIFT. I'm quite sure you heard about this organization. SWIFT means Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication. So most of the world is using SWIFT to make money transfers between countries, and it makes it pretty easy. Basically, SWIFT is like a messenger that banks use to send money to each other. So these banks created it for their own convenience and for the convenience of their customers. There are many types of cooperatives, agricultural, house and financial, consumer, but all of them work more or less in the same way, based on the same principles of benefit for its members and owners. Cooperatives are also pretty democratic. Votes for the decision are taken directly or through representation. Despite all the benefits of cooperatives, decision-making might take quite some time. Keep in mind that cooperatives and partnerships are not the same thing because they pursue different objectives. If it's unclear, please let me know in the comments. So let's have a look at this picture that I drew myself, by the way. And we can see that we've already talked about all three types of for-profit social enterprises. Now we're going to talk about a non-profit category and there's only one type, NGO. When we talk about non-governmental organization, the first thing that comes to my mind is United Nations. After the Second World War, this is when these terms started to make most sense. The weird part about NGOs is that there is no fixed definition, so understanding of NGOs might differ in different countries, but all of them are usually non-profit and they usually have public trust. The United Nations Department of Global Communications defined NGOs as not-for-profit, voluntary citizens group that is organized on a local, national or international level to address issues in support of the public good. So this is a pretty good definition, sounds very good, very nice, but also it's quite vague, don't you think? Some examples of uh, NGOs could be organizations that are concerned with environmental issues, public health issues, human rights, or lobbying, or trade unions, or even political parties. But the main feature of NGOs, it's in their name. NGO, non-governmental organizations. They do not belong to the government. Some of them receive government grants and funds, but governments do not in any way, or at least they're not supposed to, be involved in running an NGO. The examples of NGOs are Greenpeace, Amnesty International and Oxfam. I'm quite sure you're familiar with these organizations. If not, just check out their website and learn more about them. Now back to objective for this part of class, which is evaluation. I have divided it into two parts. The first part is the general evaluation, the theoretical one. The second one is a comment from Irina and Masha from Smenka Show and Geek Teachers that I told you about before, which is a bit more practical, because they are real social entrepreneurs that really run a real social enterprise. Let's see theoretical first. So on the one hand, social enterprises can boast about customer loyalty. People really like buying stuff from good companies, because when they buy it from them, it makes them feel that they contribute to something good. So this feel good factor results in increased customer loyalty and repeat purchases. In addition to that, social enterprises are socially and ecologically sustainable. They do no harm to the environment and they care about people. In addition to that, they can promote positive change 
in fact just make people's life better to a certain extent. On the other hand, compliance costs, or costs of being ethical in this case, can be quite high. For example, let's say you are a social enterprise, you are a coffee shop that hires people uh, who are struggling to find job and you only use eco-friendly materials in your enterprise so you have an ethical dilemma you can buy coffee cups from a cheap supplier but they'll be made of plastic or you can buy coffee cups from an eco-friendly supplier who charges slightly higher prices of course you will go for eco-friendly one because you are a social enterprise that is concerned about environment and society so it will result in higher costs sometimes being ethical is more expensive However, the more businesses become ethical, the cheaper it gets. That is why social enterprises are not always economically sustainable and financing might be an issue for them. In addition to that, transparency leads to prolonged decision-making. For example, what Irina and Masha do in the Smenka show is renovate the classrooms. They cannot start renovating the classroom until they get permission from the local community, which includes the school principal probably, probably teachers, I'm not sure, but they definitely have to make sure other people let them do that, which might result in quite a lengthy process if people are a little bit reluctant to do that. Now pros and cons from Arena and Masha. So they agree that inspiring people for a positive change is one of the main benefits of running a social enterprise. Also opportunity to have an impact on people's lives quality is something that drives them to become social entrepreneurs. However, traditional promotion and targeting do not work, you have to reach people. What Arena told me is that uh, if you are selling shoes, for example, you can just target your audience on social media and ads are pretty easy to target. But with social enterprise, it's pretty hard. You don't really know who your audience is. And even if you know, targeting will not work in this case because you need to reach people. You need to approach them personally and make them understand how important change, positive change is. In addition to that, income is very hard to forecast because social enterprises very often rely on donations or sponsors, which is very hard to predict compared to traditional businesses that have cash flow forecasts. Despite the social focus, very often people don't need it. Very often people say, yeah, this classroom could be better, but it's fine the way it is. I don't really care that much. So the most important part is actually delivering this message, conveying this message to people that you do need this change and we're here to help you, not just to make money. And finally, people are not always happy to pay for good deeds. They think that all good things should be free. Yeah, this is a bit weird, but I guess some people really do think so. If you're not sure about something or you don't understand these pros and cons or simply want to know more, I'm quite sure Arena and Masha will be happy if you reach out to them. I will leave some contact information below. Now back to class objectives. So we had four objectives. If you feel that now you can distinguish between private and public sector, you can evaluate the four types of business organizations, you can evaluate different features of for-profit social enterprises and non-profit social enterprises, then it means that you did a great job. If you feel like something isn't clear, maybe in addition to watching a video class, you wanna read it on my website or maybe you want to just watch it again or ask me a question. Regardless of that, I'm really happy you watched this video. Please subscribe and like. I do it for free. I put a lot of effort into it. So any help or any feedback would be appreciated. Thank you.